Hi everyone, um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, my name's Jasmine, I'm from Carcanet Press. It's just gone 7 p.m. so I think we're going to get going. Um, thank you all for coming to this book launch. Um, we really appreciate your support and for showing up um, on this rainy evening to launch Rebecca's book. Um, obviously we're here to launch Red Gloves by Rebecca Watts. This is her new collection. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. I'm just going to run over uh, how this is going to work and point you to some uh, things that we'd like you to find. Um, so this event's going to last about one hour. Um, I'm going to disappear in a second and Paul Stevenson will appear. Um, you, you may know Paul, he's also a poet um, and you might know him from the Poetry in Oldborough Festival, uh, which he helps to run. So he will appear, he's going to introduce Rebecca um, before Rebecca comes and reads some poems from the book. She'll also be sharing the text, so they'll be up on your screen so you can read along while she's reading. If you do need to see her face again, if you need to lip read or anything like that, you can double click on her face or you can make it bigger while you're watching. Um, but do also find the chat. It's cool that some of you have already found the chat. Um, you can see people saying hi. Do let us know what you think of the poems while the event's going on. Um, yeah, send your messages in. That's really nice to read those while everything's going on. Um, please do also try to find the Q&A box. There's a button that says Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, after Rebecca's read, Paul will come back and they'll have a bit of a discussion about the book. Um, but we would, if, if we've got time, we'd like to put some audience questions to Rebecca. So please do find the Q&A box and use that. Um, at the end of the event, I think Rebecca's going to come back and close with a couple more poems. Um, and then, yeah, that, that'll all last about an hour. So um, right now, obviously, you've all paid to be here. So thank you so much. Um, you will all receive um, the discount code in an email tomorrow. I'm putting it in the chat, but don't worry if this is happening too quickly. Uh, check your emails tomorrow. That will come with the code um, and you'll have a couple of weeks to use that to get your discount on the book. So um, without further ado, I'm going to um, bring back Paul and Rebecca, and we'll get going with the reading. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm delighted to be here with you to launch Rebecca Watts' much-awaited second collection, Red Gloves. Thank you for zooming in. As Jazz said, my name is Paul Stevenson. I'll be hosting the event for the next hour until eight o'clock. Um, Rebecca's going to read a fair selection of poems from the collection, then I'll ask her a few questions about the poems and her writing, and then we'll have indeed some, some Q&A, so do use that Q&A function. We've got a full house tonight, I think we've got an international audience, so please do um, take a chance to say hello in the chat function, and uh, say hello to Rebecca, tell us where you're watching from, and comment on the poems during the reading if you like. Um, so, a little bit about Rebecca, perhaps. Well, Rebecca Watts grew up in Suffolk and currently lives in Cambridge, where she works in a library and as a freelance editor. In 2014, she took part in the Poetry Trust's Albra 8 scheme, which is where I met Rebecca. We had a wonderful week with the poets Peter Sansom and Michael Lasky, and I remember Rebecca drove me back through the winding bucolic lanes of Suffolk. Um, a wonderful week. Rebecca then had poems in Carcanet's New Poetry 6 anthology and her debut collection, The Met Office Advises Caution, was published by Carcanet in 2016. And it was a Poetry Book Society recommendation. It was shortlisted for the 2017 Seamus Heaney Centre First Collection Prize. And it also featured in The Guardian and the Financial Times' Best Books of 2016 list. Now, in, in 2018, she was a literature finalist in the Rolex Mentor and Protégé Arts Initiative. And in 2019, she was awarded the Hawthornden Fellowship. She's also the editor of A New Selected Poems of Elizabeth Jennings, published by Carcanet last November. Now, just to give you a little bit of context to this new book, I mentioned the Met Office advises caution, which um, many of you will know with this beautiful cover. Um, a brilliant and original debut collection published four years ago. It was described as witty and warm-hearted guide to the English landscape. And it certainly offered a fresh take on nature poetry with poems about um, 
new proposed bridges and the long jump to poems about the emperor penguin and Antarctica. Uh, these poems spoke in a very matter of fact way, a very clear way about all sorts of unusual subjects, um, but with the weather very much a protagonist there among the, the human drama. And I think that first book is a, is a showcase to Rebecca's unique voice, uh, the very tender way in which she marries science and realism with romanticism, in the way in which her poems are each a subtle inquiry on the world around her, and, and therefore um, each one an act of self-inquiry. Now, I'm really eager to hear the new poems, and I'm sure you are too, to learn also what Rebecca has been writing on and what she's been writing around. And so without further ado, Rebecca, could we please hear some poems? Thanks, Paul. You can. Firstly, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Okay. Um, I'm getting quite distracted by all the tech and it's just amazing to see people coming in from all over the world and people I know and people I don't know. So thank you so much. I'm really excited um, that you could all join me for this um, event. It's an event, right? Even though we're not in the same place. Um, I'm really aware particularly as well that several, well, many, many of you um, are people who wouldn't ordinarily make it to a book launch of mine, whether because you're in a completely different place or because you have childcare responsibilities or just because you have a probably justified aversion to being trapped in a room full of poetry people. Um, so thank you for making the effort to join. Um, and I think there's also right now a, um, a rival event being run by Arvon uh, with Will Self reading. So I just wanted to say well done also for uh, making this choice, you're on the right side. Um, and I'm also aware that there's at least one person in the audience whose birthday is. So happy birthday, Greg, and anyone else who happened to be born on this felicitous day in a previous year. Um, as it's summer, ha ha, raining, um, I will kick off with a poem called Barbecues. And to do that, I'm just going to share my screen. And I hope someone will type in the chat if that doesn't look like it should. Barbecues. In the future, it'll be different. We can have barbecues. You'll pop to home base for a new gas canister and what the hell, splash out on a garden table the lot of us can fit round. Plastic but tasteful oval shaped and forest green with six matching chairs. And we'll arrive with a selection of salads in patterned bowls, cling filmed for freshness. And there'll be printed napkins that won't blow away because it's perfectly still and warm, the end of July. And the children will sit on a blanket and join the conversation and the laughter. And before we eat, we'll have a toast to happy families and the meat will be tender, flavoursome but not charred. And when you lift the lid to and the sausages and see them bunched like fingers in a boxer's mitt, you'll feel only hunger and magically won't recall the past in which I punched your daughter. Um, the book's called Red Gloves, obviously, and um, the boxer's mitt is a red glove, but it's not the red gloves um, that give the book its title. Um, so this is the title poem, where the gloves are, I suppose they represent something quite um, other than violence, although what they represent, I'm not exactly sure. Um, maybe you can type it in the chat. And this poem's for Sarah Hall. Red gloves. The women are carrying the coffin under the fear of slippage, they make slow steps. We cannot say that they advance. More than one woman is weathering from the cool top of her head to her strained fingers to her toes pushed together in interview shoes. The urge, like a riptide, to run backwards and away. Today is not a normal day. How awkward we are. 
Even were they to confer, it would not be possible for these four women to set down their load with elegance. The military could manage it. But military is system, control from above. The women are moving from within. More than one will go to ground today. More than one will be tugged otherwards, husbands and children. How requiring, how embarrassable we are. One is wearing red woolen gloves. She is pressing them to the wicker as though without her hand's small force, the entire construction would fold. It's funny, when you're at a real reading, you've got a book to fiddle with to kind of generate a few seconds of pause between the poems. But if I just stand here, you'll think I've uh, gone weird. Um, yeah, so I wanted to counteract the funereal vibe with um, something a bit more hopeful. And I chose a summer wedding poem. Uh, there are several sort of wedding-y, marriage-y poems in the book. Um, and I thought that this one would be cheerful because it's about flowers. And then I realised that this also um, has the image of folding in it. So I don't know what that says about me, but. Um, sweet peas for the wedding. Glorify, even as they fall away. Defy all skeptics, all resistors. Folding in, over, out, purple, pink, white, luxuriant, coy and completely at home, open to anything. Heads weight and hearts weightlessness, balanced for a day, three days at most, once you cut them, softening as they droop and you look, not wanting to touch. Um, I probably should have mentioned that I deemed my house unsuitable for broadcast, so I've come to work. I work in a library, um, so this is not my really aggressively um, classified personal book collection. Um, but yeah, I work in one of the libraries in um, within Cambridge University, and um, I suppose because of being here and um, being in a kind of student-focused job um, and also having lots of friends who are teachers as well I felt really aware of how funny this year has gone in terms of all the the kind of rituals and the rites of passage that we work towards everything building towards the summer term and exams and then the release with the kind of you know parties and mabels and graduations and all of that which just hasn't happened this year so um, I thought I would read a poem that refers to one of those uh, kind of rites of passage, the end of year ball. Um, you can't tell from the typography, but the way I wrote it, the, um, the M of movements is a capital M. So um, I'm thinking of particular movements, for example, um, the feminist movement. There have been movements, and still we anticipate the ball for our entire last year. My vixen caressing her silken purple gloves. Your wolf hind-legging in a borrowed tuxedo. And trot through the atavistic dances, hoping to be saved the unspeakable bother of striding alone across unploughed terrain, which would ruin the shoes we've selected precisely to inhibit our running away from the proud, deprived mothers who drop us at the entrance and smile through tears while their cameras gobble us up. I actually, um, I, I'm, that poem came from uh, reading The Female Eunuch, which I just randomly picked off a shelf in the library um, a few decades too late. But anyway, I went a bit fairy tale. Um, yeah, so we've all been stuck indoors more than usual. So I thought I would do a few sea and swimming and generally outdoorsy poems um, to inject some fresh air into the proceedings. Um, and this is one that probably I wouldn't ordinarily read um, in a live reading where you couldn't see 
the text because um, as you can see here it's it's doing some little uh, visual tricks um, the title is generally a phrase that's used in reference to um, Picasso but I'm pretty sure um, the similarities end there my blue period No one could create great works in those pyjamas, you said. It's high time you got up and got out, you said. I'd love to tell you how I did get out. As out as out could be, with all my clothes off, walking away from this too, too solid ground. The very minute the sea melted over that groin, the very spot where I'd left my stuff, even you wouldn't have predicted it. And now I feel much like my phone, which lies drying beside me in a tub of rice. Um, I gather that putting things into dry rice is a, is a way of trying to extract water from them. Um, but I can't vouch for whether it actually works. Um, the speaker of that poem does at least manage to get in the sea, even if it didn't go quite to plan. Um, in this next poem, there's a different obstacle. Um, this is actually based on personal experience to the extent that I made a, a two hour drive um, to go swimming on a hot day on the Suffolk coast and um, determined to get in. And when I got there, I just saw the shoreline kind of dotted with jellyfish and I couldn't, I just, I, I pride myself on being quite brave with cold water and stuff, but I, once I'd seen them, I just, yeah, wasn't gonna happen. At bay. I try to resist the sway of things I've seen. Images slapping the shore of the brain like all these jellyfish. I came here to get in but no amount of thought can cancel them. No words, though I tell myself be brave, no numbers, though I count 11 fewer in the sea to sting me, and no, I can bear much more than a brush with common nettles. None of it adds up to the pulsing of one, just there, a clump of translucent matter drifting with no more intention than a weed. Override, override, but the mind overrides itself, pale body, water, dread. I back away, get dressed, drive further up the coast to try again, a little less intrepid. Um, those of you who know me or have read any of the various blogs and articles and things I've written will um, know that I'm obsessed basically with um, the Lake District and particularly with Grasmere where I lived um, only for a year a decade ago um, and I worked at the Wordsworth Trust which looks after Dove Cottage the former home of William and Dorothy Wordsworth and I really got into the whole romantic vibe and mindset while I was there um, and so this is just a little poem about um, a rather more successful straightforward immersion experience in Grasmere. Grasmere early. After the edginess of flint, it's pure silk, the lake slipping its skin, mutual acclimatization, first arms, then shoulders acquiring an antique tinge, ale through a glass, grip so tight you forget who's cooling who, Eyes widening to take it in, felled utterly as you swim an almost perfect circle. Um, and this is a, I suppose, one of my counter poems to the whole um, embracing of the romantic vibe. Um, that idea of nature being sort of cleansing and healing and um, safe to approach, I suppose. Um, this one, 
I'm going to read tonight for anyone who's tuning in from Lyme Regis, um, where the cob is the name for the harbour wall. Be careful on the cob. Be careful on the cob. High winds do not distinguish man from dog or mislaid crabbing bucket from discarded chip fork. High winds will seize anything that's not tied down and the cob will disown what isn't its to give. Do not dip your toe. Oh, hasten away from the barricade's edge for the water's cold and the currents that suck and churn and raise white spirits and grey ghouls below the cob are keen. And do not sit long on the prickly wall with a canvas expression and paint tube eyes. Where the land drops off, disaster lies. Our defences are licked by a savage tongue and everything of use to us ends at the cob. I'm sure it's really quite a safe place to be, I don't know. I took the, um, the title from the signs that you see around the cob there um, about not walking on the wall when it's windy, etc. Um, but really, it's all very genial. Um, so, yeah, I'm always, I suppose, trying to test or balance this tendency to idealise nature and what we perceive of as natural um, against, I suppose, more close observation of what is actually there. And um, anyone who's seen my first book will know that usually when I go outside a dead animal appears. Um, <laughs> there's not so much of that in this book, um, but there, there are several walking poems that kind of inventory and explore the things that, that I encounter as I'm, as I'm going around. And, um, and this is one of those poems. Um, yeah, it's called the Desire Path, which is the name for those paths that are created unofficially, sort of just by people walking on the same, on the same stretch of ground. Now I go back, I notice the jagged fallen trees and the new twigs I'd thought of as budding bobbled with disease and the birches unfocused eyes and the scattering of feathers like a planned demolition. The river curls round on itself. Someone has knotted a scraggy red ribbon to a stick. Soon the sleepy adder will stir under her quilt. And I am afraid and ill-equipped to wade the few metres that divide me from the far bank where spring is. Um, I wrote that poem last spring, uh, 2019, when I was lucky enough to have a month's residency at the Hawthornden Literary Retreat, which is um, based in a castle in Scotland, just a few miles outside of Edinburgh. Um, and that, that month that I was there was really the first concerted effort I made to pull this collection together from just a um, scraggy bunch of individual poems. Um, so I'll always associate this book with that place. Um, and several of the poems that I wrote there also um, kind of came into the book at a late stage and sort of shifted the tone slightly. Um, so I'm going to read another Hawthornden poem, um, especially for my Hawthornden friends that I know are in the audience, um, who may recognise some of the characters in this one. The Drawing Room. Another lovely dark green papered wall, camellia patterned, ferned and leafed, has been spoiled by having to bear portraits of gilded men. Oh, they were famous, or they weren't, and my sneeze is a complex amalgam of reverence and allergy. They lived, were painted, died, and now I'd like to read my book without them being there. I'd like to stare at a lovely dark green papered wall and say to nobody, Camellia, Fern, Leaf. Um, I have since been informed by the wonderful administrator at Hawthornden that um, 
the portraits of the hideous men um, have been joined recently by a rather formidable painting of Mrs. Drew Hines, who is the late um, patron of that literary residence. And um, also she's been joined by a photograph of Ivy Compton Burnett. So the gender balance is being addressed, if not the aesthetic. Um, so yes, images of books and reading um, often crop up in my poems, I suppose, because I work in a library um, and I'm surrounded by books all the time. And um, I thought to thank my uh, boss and colleagues for letting me come in after hours, I'd read a couple of library and work inspired poems. Um, this is another one that I probably wouldn't read in a, in a normal reading. Um, because again, it's doing something on the page that I sort of want you to be able to see. Um, having bled on a library book, you'll be inclined to regret the body, its readiness to spoil the good clean margin with a living stain. You'll resist the fact you can't at all times contain the clever business of circulation that occasionally a pressure builds and has to be released. All the skin's defence is breached, so a little of your mess leaks out. You'll sigh, acknowledging that the printed words no shield against the givens, seepage, decay. You'll read on, distracted by the rust, blot, smear, and the question of whether you'll be forced to pay. We're very generous in this library. We don't um, flick through all the books inspecting them for stains and what have you, um, but you never know. Uh, this is another work inspired poem in a different way in that it came out of something I saw on a um, office trip, would you believe it, to the um, local household waste and recycling centre, which was fascinating as it turned out. Glamour. Life isn't glamorous for the hawk employed to circle landfill, deterring the scavengers that flock here to feed and nest in the nearby villages. For us, released from the office, this frenzy of bird life in the midst of dystopia is spectacular. Against the rubbish's mishmash of color, and the lazy sky, clarity of white and black, seagulls and crows. We see it by chance, the hawk, patient on its perch, while a handler squirts disinfectant from a plastic bottle all over it, drenching its feathers, disabling it from flight. We look and see beauty in its bedragglement, trust, as it waits, growing dry, amid concrete and dumper trucks. Um, that's one of two or three birds of prey poems in the book. And as in my first book, there are, there are lots of birds um, in red gloves. And I think, well, I know in some poetry circles, um, birds are considered a faux pas or at least a cliche. Um, but in my defense, my birds are usually specific individual birds um, rather than an evocation of bird life in general and um, that's definitely the case with this poem. There's a blackbird that lives with us and in fact in the Met office there's a reference to um, in the Budlier above the recycling bins that blackbird waiting and I really like to think that the one that's made it into this book is the same one. Um, according to the RSPB website the oldest known blackbird was 20, so it is possible. I think it's quite unlikely. Encore. Will the blackbird be homeless? Now the buddleia in which he nested and sang sweet spring is hacked. Will the wall be a wall? Now the shambling rose which lent its yellow lights has been cut back. Veins of old ivy, like Lichtenberg figures, 
cling to the brickwork. Lichen's soft language spreads in the joins. Something new is wobbling outwards from the trellis. The he bird makes of gutter pipe and shed roof a singing post. Um, and I'm just going to finish with one more, which was originally written as part of a commission from um, Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge, um, but in recent months has, I suppose, come to seem generally applicable. When all this is over, I mean to run fast where the buzz of machines and the humdrum of walls and the flummox of words are behind me. Where no one, not even myself, observes me. Oh yes, I intend to run in the dark, where the thud of the feet eclipses the thud of the heart, where a chill night bites me and a slick sweat coats me and street lamps gild me and church bells ring me. Thanks. I'll stop sharing now. Paul, are you coming back? Rebecca, thank you for a beautiful, beautiful reading. That was really sublime. I've decamped now to a red chair. I felt for a Q&A about a book called Red Gloves, I should be in a red chair. Um, it's, it's a collection that is so rich in colour and rich in the elements. Um, it's from the red of the gloves, of course, to the buglia, the pinks and purples, to the blue and the green of the outdoors. And you take us to many coastal locations. And I think, you know, with the confinement, I'm certainly hungry for the sea. And I really, really needed these poems. They're airy, full of flow and flight and high winds on the cob. And they took me outside to breathe and to, to swell my lungs. So thank you for that. And um, I think, you know, also we have so much hope placed in science at the moment. And yet there's so much uncertainty and anxiety. Again, I needed, I needed the humour of these poems, the escape, um, the dream life, the romanticism. I have a few questions, of course, um, that I've been thinking about. First of all, quick question. Title poem, red gloves. Why red gloves? Why not green or yellow gloves? Could you tell us a little bit about where the poem came from? Sure. Um, well, the red gloves in the title poem are real gloves and they belong to um, the brilliant writer, Sarah Hall, who is also my friend. And they crop up actually as well in Sarah Hall's short story, Sudden Traveller. Um, and she happened to be wearing these red woolen gloves when we were out for a walk and she was telling me about her mum's funeral um, and obviously she's a great writer so I immediately had a kind of a cinematic uh, vision in my head of this whole scene and the politics of this scene and the complexities emotional kind of interpersonal of what was going on at this event and um, we talked about it and I wrote the poem really for her so so the red was was because it was real um but it seemed to me that i suppose a funeral is quite a monochrome event i just had this image of you know almost like a shingless list moment where everything's in black and white and then you just have this red you know the red hands carrying the white coffin the black clothes and all of that and um so red i suppose then for me became symbolic of what of um of the more human side of the ritual that is the funeral i suppose so the kind of i don't know abstract things like uh, ab abstract words that are very real things like love and pain and fear and um that kind of stuff so i suppose that poem really triggered triggered one mode that runs through the book that's kind of trying to get to or articulate aspects of those big red emotions alongside, I suppose, what I characterise as the more, um, the calmer, more romantic 
side of nature, the blues and the greens, that, it, that is more typically my instinctively that the blue green is the mode I go for. And so I made an effort with these poems over the last few years to try and go towards the red a bit more and see what happened. Sure. I was going to, yeah, thinking about these forces that are at play. I mean, you talk about um, human strength, physical and emotional strength, um, perhaps versus the non-human forces of nature and physics that operate in some of the other poems. So how did you see this, this poem, which is quite unlike any other in the book. It seems to announce a number of the themes. How do you see it relates to the other poems that follow? Because this is the third poem in the book. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's tricky. It's, it, it's this balancing act I'm often trying to do between, um, I suppose, ab abstract or in some ways sort of philosophical thought experiments like kind of looking at looking at social structures and looking at um like you say physical forces in the world whether that's say as exhibited with the sea or kind of I don't know the ways that people move around and interact with the non-human as well like animals and stuff like that how to how that's how that sits with the real deeper human elements and feelings that the red for me became symbolic of so in that poem I suppose well there are lots of poems that are doing this that are kind of subtly asking questions about relationships like marriage and parenthood and things like that 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 we all consider or are part of and um and where it kind of leaves you when you start asking those questions and you can't expect a resolution to those questions and you can't expect the poems to resolve those questions either. So I suppose one of the things that came from that poem is seeing a poem itself as this a kind of space in which questions can continue to exist and complexity can be held and can be confusing and contradictory and that's okay, but you can still get some kind of visual imagery or sensory experience coming through the writing as well. Yeah, I, I can certainly see that, you know, the, um, the oppositions of, of sort of control and protocol and restraint, maybe even conformity to societal codes, maybe even Englishness. Um, and then these, these sort of occurrences of seepage and slippage of memory, of fear of blood, maybe things that are involuntary, um, the things that are inside us. Um, yeah, so do you have anything else to say about these oppositions? I suppose that there is one, there's one short poem in the book that I didn't put in the set list called That Sort of Note. And um, I'll just read it actually, because I've got the book here. It's very short. And um, it's also actually based on uh, something a friend said to me um, a few years ago. So it's, it's present, the quotation is presented as such in the poem in, in the italics. We need more inner red, my friend said. Show us your inner red. Oh, but my eyes are a hazel branch snapped in two and my body's a hollow the wind blows through and the blood in my veins is polar sea blue and the words denial, my friend said. So this kind of, again, it's the blues and greens of, of that kind of romantic, like wanting, wanting the world and nature and everything to be as nice and delightful and joyful as it sometimes seems and also recognizing the need to look to the nature within which is the red stuff and kind of try to find a way for those things to coexist do you do you feel that your poems are in any way political i know that's a big question in terms of content or as an act or event and i, and I ask this because i think we've we've talked in the past about how maybe some critics have sort of um drawn a line between what might be called nature poetry and then what poems that are more, you know, explicitly and directly charged. Mm. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I think, um, so in terms of what we've just been talking about, about kind of wanting to question and also to, to, to depict or evoke kind of situations in which you can suddenly see structures and system, you know, social structures and systems and maybe individual habits that are usually hidden. Um, I mean, I'm interested in 
exposing those and examining them and asking what's really going on there and why and whose motives are powering these situations and stuff like that um and i'm interested in the way i suppose how we govern ourselves um in terms of you know socially like how we exist in relation to other people and also i suppose more existentially like on an individual basis how do you how do you square the urges and the impulses and the kind of uh instincts that are driven by the body and those that are driven by the mind and stuff like that so i think i suppose in that sense maybe maybe i'd call myself a social poet um yeah. definitely not political in terms of kind of party lines and fixed statements and fixed positions um which i think is unfortunately the way the way that we experience politics today is kind of you know it seems that one of the aims of politics is to try and strip language of all meaning which is the complete opposite project of poetry and the opposite of what certainly i'm trying to do in my writing which is to concentrate attention on language and the sound and the meaning of words that then create images in the reader's mind so that you're talking to each other um so a little bit but not really is probably the answer. Good answer. Good answer. we were talking earlier about um slippage and seepage and you've been talking about the mind and the body so you bled on a library book <laughs> probably everybody watching this wants to know where was this what happened which book was it do you remember um and are we in danger of pulling that book off the shelf well Yes, that is a real library book, and I can't remember what it was. It was probably from this library, because it's the main one I borrowed from. But it wasn't my blood. Um, I th I, I, I'm pretty sure that the idea for that poem came from reading a book and turning it over and going, Ugh, you know, there's some kind of smear in the margin or whatever. And then thinking, well, you know, why am I disgusted by this? Firstly, as a librarian, you know, paper cuts are really the stock in trade. <laughs> of the occupation so it's not surprising to find something like that on on the page of the book but also you know why does it seem so shocking against the kind of nice clean page and text and whatever so um so yeah you might find it but i promise it wasn't me so i want to ask you actually i mentioned in the bio that you recently edited the uh Karkinet selected poems of, of elizabeth jennings which you've done since the met office and um you know, I recently went back to her poem, Song for a Birth or a Death, and I was reminded of some of the key themes of her work, human versus animal world, wild and savage in nature, instinct and fear, um, human love and pleasure. And I sense some kind of mutual preoccupations and concerns. So I was wondering to what extent do you feel that the act of editing the book, and I know you spent a couple of months perhaps on, on, on her poems, to what extent has that informed the shape and style of this new book? Mm. Well, it was really interesting because, so yeah, I was working on the jet, actually, I'm just gonna share my screen because I've got the, um, if I can work out how to do it, I've got the, some, some Jenningsy stuff on here. So this is the book we're talking about for anyone who doesn't know her work. Um, Elizabeth Jennings was, really quite a major 20th century poet. She was one of the best-selling poets of the second half of the 20th century. Um, but I think her popularity kind of peaked in the 70s and 80s. And certainly I hadn't encountered much of her work um, where she used to be on the sort of school syllabus and things like that. So um, she's an interesting figure. She was writing through yeah the whole of the second half of the 20th century and my task which i was very lucky to be offered by um my publisher at carcanet michael schmidt who also was um jennings's publisher for the majority of her career um this task of i suppose reviving jennings's reputation and introducing her to a new possibly younger audience by winnowing her enormous collected poems which is over a thousand pages to this sort of i've got a copy of the actual book here this kind of nice 200 page um selected and it was interesting so i was doing that in 
the first few months of 2019, just before I went on that residency I mentioned, where I started pulling my own book together. And the two processes, I mean, in both cases, it's an act of curation because you start with loads of individual poems and you have to find a way of choosing the best ones and putting them together in a way that that shows the poet in their best light and that really brings out the, the most interesting elements of the work. Um, but on the other hand, it was completely different because in the case of Jennings, you know, her first collection was published in 1953, her last one um, just after her death in 2001. So the whole story of her life and the trajectory of her career was laid out for me already in order in the collected poems and I was just picking from among it to kind of curate this book. Um, whereas when I spread all my poems out, I just went, what's, you know, wh I don't know what the story is here. And part of the process of pulling the book together was to try and create, I suppose, a, a story for myself and my work through the book in terms of finding relationships between poems that kind of made them speak to each other and that generated new energies that maybe weren't in the poems as they stood alone. So, um, yeah, but it was, it, it was inspiring to work on the Jennings and she's a very strange and quite brilliant writer. Um, have I got time to just read a short one of hers? Perhaps a, perhaps a short one, yeah, and then we'll go really for some okay. questions. So um, this is one of her sort of middle career poems. Um, from her collection Extending the Territory, and it's called The Child's Story. When I was small and they talked about love, I laughed, but I ran away and I hid in a tall tree, or I lay in asparagus beds, but I still listened. The blue dome sang with the wildest birds and the new sun sang in the idle noon. But then I heard love Love rung from the steeples, each belfry, and I was afraid, and I watched the cypress trees join the deciduous chestnuts and oaks in a crowd of shadows, and then I shivered and ran and ran to the tall white house with the green shutters and dark red door, and I cried, let me in, even if you must love me. And they came and lifted me up and told me the name of the near and the far stars, and so my first love was. And I just, I love that combination of kind of emotional openness, um, willingness to kind of engage with narrative and symbolism, you know, this, the dark red door, I just, what, you know, the door into the heart, into love, I just love all that kind of symbolic stuff. And the really plain language that occasionally just goes strange, like I lay in asparagus beds, so I just think that's weird. It's just, you know, there's, so there's all this kind of visual and sensory it's just so alive and that, and that really inspired me I think and and so the the batch of poems that I wrote for my book when I was on that residency came after this and I wouldn't be surprised if if some of her bravery and her imagery kind of seeped through into my into my newer work yeah okay I've got a final question which kind of nicely segues into some of the questions that have, we've been coming um the difficult second album question, following up from the Met Office. Is this book a continuation or is it a departure? And actually Chris Edgoose recognizes a lot of the connections, reflections and developments from your first collection. The drawing room follows another painting poem in the Met Office. Um, is this a natural progression? Are you deliberately creating a series of books that will be read as a single work in future? <laughs> Ah, my life story. Um, I think my collective works might end up being pretty short, actually. Um, no, I think it's funny because when I when I put the Met Office together, which was it was published in September 2016, but I actually stopped including poems from about the end of 2014, I think, because I had some some work there, which is now in this book, which I just felt was slightly different from the poems, from the, from the dominant vibe in my first book, which was a much more, much more focused on nature and the relationship between people and the physical environment. And I think, as I said earlier, when I read the poem, that sort of note, like I've, try, I've tried to go more towards my inner red for the poems in this book, which 
comes up in some of them and yet still there are those people nature poems the swimmers and the kind of and the people looking at birds and walking and stuff like that so I think it's got one foot in but I would hope that it's a bit a bit of a striding away um onto some new ground perhaps. Okay Rory Waterman asks how many of the poems did you write at Hawthornden or did you use that month primarily to edit and what was the effect of place on the poems? Mm. Um, I think there's seven or eight poems I wrote there that I ended up putting in the book um, and it was brilliant because I went I went there to edit um, well by, as is always the way with these things you apply and then so many months pass and the thing actually happens so in my application I said I was going there to I wanted to go there to write poems for my second book but by the time I got there I felt like I pretty much you know I had a batch of 50 or so that I wanted to edit and and revise and kind of shuffle around um, but the ones I wrote there do have a different vibe I think and certainly the desire path is I mean, for me, it's just so vividly that place. I think being over the border in Scotland, being away from home for a month, being kind of away from the internet and stuff like that, just, I, I could just kind of slow down a bit and let let new things come in, which is the, you know, it's the beauty of any sort of residency situation. If you're, if you're lucky enough to get one, even for a few days, you can just find a different mindset because you're out of your, your normal, routines and habits and yeah so it was great. okay we we had actually a few questions emailed in people are incredibly well prepared Catherine maris asks you what values do you feel that you share with the romantic poets yeah obviously love of grassmere um i think i'm always i feel like i'm always banging on about this because i've i've written a few things here and there about particularly about wordsworth because um because I worked at his um, former home and the, the museum and collections associated with him up there in Grasmere. And then when I moved to Cambridge, I ended up here, which in St. John's College, which was Wordsworth College. And that was completely by chance. So since working here, I've curated exhibitions on him and done various things. And, and I think what I always come back to is, um, so he, he wrote this long essay to introduce um, one of his collections the lyrical ballads um and this was published around 1800 so more than 200 years ago but essentially he outlined principles that i think all poets whether they realize all poets writing in english whether they realize it or not are kind of infused with these values and they are things like that poetry should be written in the language that people actually speak and that poetry should deal with human characters and human incidents um, and the the poet what the poet brings to the source material of um, worldly experiences it, it, he says a certain coloring of imagination so just the idea that imagination is something that we all possess you know irrespective of social class or whatever um, and we can all use it to kind of experience freedom from physical and emotional constraints and stuff like that. I think all that's still true. Um, the idea that it's difficult, defining this is more complex now, but that the natural environment, that engaging with, with nature and the outdoors can cleanse and rejuvenate the human spirit. And, you know, th these are all Wordsworth's radical ideas in, in 1800. And we need to caveat them maybe and and redefine some of the terms but fundamentally i think anyone who is is writing nature poetry or even thinking about nature or poetry is kind of doing it in the shadow of these definitions that wordsworth laid down all that time ago so so they're the things that i really engage with and sometimes i try to test them and question them and write against them but in my life i'm just really up for going for it um as much as possible, yeah. And moving to the Lake District, ideally. Okay, maybe we can have some quick fire answers to two or three more questions. Um, John Cantor asks about the speakability. He says, are some of your poems actually unspeakable or unperformable? And he mentions one in particular, the studio. Or do you think you could read all of your poems aloud? Um, so I always try to write in a way that I wouldn't feel squeamish 
saying stuff like that. So I don't ever want to use a word that I would really never say myself that felt artificial and unless, unless I'm, you know, doing a persona um, poem, but that poem actually in the studio, it's a long thin poem and it's really repetitive. It says little this, little that, little this, little that. And I read it, it takes about a minute to read. And I did read it last year at a school, an event I did at a school. And it was just, it was so embarrassing because they couldn't see it on the page and they just didn't know how long I was going to go on for. I went, so I could see that I was working down this list and, you know, I mean, it's hard enough reading to, to the youth um, because they were, you know, they don't want to show any, anything on their face. So you're kind of really trying to get them on side. And um, yeah, it was terrible. And I found myself apologizing for it afterwards, which is, a, it's never necessary, but you know, I was just like, Oh, that just sounded like a weird list. So I think probably I wouldn't read that one again okay. in future. Quick Even question though... from uh, Kathy Pimlet: Is the use of white space on the page, because you do play with that a lot, is the driver of that primarily visual or does it come from the sound of the poem as you read it and you make it? Yeah, it's both. I think, I think for me, it's, it starts off as visual, but it's definitely also time. So I always do want my poems in theory to be or aural. Um, but I, I do, I'm, I'm very, um, I have a soft spot for concrete poetry in these kind of, these visual tricks and I have to try not to do it too often. Um, but yeah, so it's both. Okay. We have a question from Adam, um, Crothers about form and your use of free verse versus form, but I know you've written and talked about that on the excellent interview you did with him on the Carl Connect blog. Um, so I think we're at three minutes too. And I think you're going to treat us to one final poem. And this is, in fact, the first poem from the book. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'll just share that. Um, OK, yeah. So uh, the first poem, it kind of starts at the end. Economics. Everything comes down to numbers in the end. This morning, a blackbird woke me up. Five swans in formation trailed their silver chevrons upriver, unbothered by the heron's slow torpedo. Three horses in maroon jackets stood mystified by their own breath. A green finch and 39 cows patterned the field. Twin black labs trotted through the long grass, jingling and unearthed a compact of magpies. I didn't count the dandelion clocks. There were so many. You ask me, would I move to the city to be with you? I'm telling you what I saw. You can do the maths. It's a love poem of sorts. Yeah. And the blackbird, the blackbird is in that one as well, so can't get away from him. Well, congratulations, Rebecca, and thank you for such a, a beautiful reading this evening. And thank you, everybody, for attending, for Zooming in, and please do buy the book. Jazz is going to put a code up now on the chat function or look on the Carcanet website. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, uh, Paul, thanks. Well done, Rebecca. Um, and well done, Paul, and thank you both. It was a great conversation. and. Well done on using the tech so elegantly. Um, you really did succeed. <laughs> it was a really, really nice event. Um, thank you guys all for being here. Like Paul mentioned, I'm going to put the code um, and the link for you to buy the book. I'm putting it in the chat now. Um, don't worry if you don't get there on time. That'll come in an email tomorrow. But um, you should all have my email address. You can email if, if you have any problems. Um, and the last thing to say is please come to our next launch. Um, we're launching Sasha Dugdale's new book, Deformations, on the 29th of July. Um, that will be a Wednesday evening at 7pm with uh, Catherine Marritt, who we had a question from earlier. So that's really nice um, that you're already here. Hi, Catherine. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks. Um, I think there's nothing else to say. I can see some messages coming in. Um, so I might just leave it running for a sec. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here and well done, Rebecca. Thank you. Bye.